going up the stairs, we had this stairway in the middle of our living room that went up to the hallway, and they would put up a, this sheet of flesh-colored fabric and have people standing behind it making shapes of body parts coming through and grabbing at me as I went by just to freak me out and make me think I was nuts so I wouldn't tell anyone anything. And they would say, that never happened, you were hallucinating. But I saw, I, I, I heard one of the people talking about it, and I saw the fabric, and I knew. They did a lot of things to you, didn't they? Oh, they are very creative, very busy. My earliest memory is being in a house with a woman who was deaf, in a basket, and watching the curtains over, over me. There were white curtains, you could see through them, and I could see, I wasn't nearsighted until I was 10, and um, you could see the trees and the, the blue sky, and she had very little furniture, and she had a dog, two dogs, a black lab and a golden retriever, and she was with a biker, he was a young biker. We were walking in the state game area on and my dad and mom, who raised me, came along and she said, Oh, what pretty little girls, because I had an identical twin and I was just learning to walk. I was probably about three. And she said, What pretty little girls, I want them. And my dad proceeded to kill the family that I was living with. So, so he might not be my dad. You're not sure who he is. Well, I know him pretty well. Some of yeah, them. Yeah, but I mean, you're not sure if he's your genetically your father. Well, when I was in high school, we did blood tests, and they didn't want me to find out that I was the mailman's daughter. You know what that means. Mm-hmm. Now, how do you know that your father killed this family? I saw it. He bludgeoned the woman in the head until she was cracked open and her brains were leaking out and she stopped. She didn't really make much noise, just a kind of grunts, like she didn't know how to scream. Mm -hmm. She was totally deaf and maybe mute. And um, the man held me and he buried him alive. He beat him and buried him. The man wasn't a, much of a fighter, but he tried to keep me away from him. And I had a brother who was three years older. He was there. I remember a little a little um, wooden bridge over like a creek. It was a very pretty place. I've always loved the woods. It's my place of escape. Now your parents were involved in the occult, weren't they? Oh yeah, they still are. What's your earliest memory of your parents being involved in a um, I don't know where my parents were because I couldn't see them, but we were in an underground cavern and they made me go through a dying animal from its butt to some other part of it and come out. And then this man wearing ram's horn headdress held me with a fancy knife and said, this woman is your mother. You have to kill her. She has committed great sin. I said, and I, I didn't really know how to talk yet. I was probably about five. And he held my hand and wounded her in the chest and cut out her heart. And they drank her blood and they gave me some of her blood and made me drink it. You can make someone swallow if you push on their throat the right, right way. And then um, he said, what you feel is adrenaline. It's excitement. It's enthusiasm. They tried to train me that this was fun, and I never believed it. So they would drink the blood of someone who was... She didn't really fight, and she wasn't tied down. She was totally nude. She didn't have real long hair. She was pale-skinned. She was not fat. She was a young lady. And that was your earliest memory of a blood sacrifice? Yeah. And then uh, when you were that young, did you ever have to actually participate in any rituals? Or? My hand was on the knife that cut her. Oh, I see. His hand was over mine, but my hand was on the knife under his, so my hand was on the knife. 
And how did you feel? Not good. I was shocked. I was like, I didn't understand death at that point. Mm -hmm. I expected her to come back. I looked for her for a long time. Wow. And how often do you think, now these are your parents, they were the people that raised you. Yeah. Okay. Um, how often did they do? I was never good with time. Okay. Uh, over the course of your lifetime, uh, I don't remember everything. I remember bits and pieces. Okay. Here and there, and not always in sequence. Okay. Alright. Alright, so we'll just meander through however you feel comfortable with what, you know, you want to talk about. For a while, my, um, my, the man who raised me, my dad, his brother raised me in his basement. And it was a dark place with a dirt floor and a lot of rocks. And it had a high up window that overlooked a schoolyard of an elementary school and had bars on it, or it looked like bars. And it was always dark. There was no light in there. There was no heat. There was no window in there. And I never made noise. I was too afraid, except for screaming when I was in pain. But he was a um, pedophile and he was married and his wife was an extreme bitch and hated my guts just for living and it was you think she was jealous i don't know i doubt it i don't think you could be jealous of a man who weighed 400 pounds or more he was not a gentle man he would wear one of those night vision things that you could see in the dark and he would um beat me up and rape me and do things he would talk to me and tell me scary things. Do you remember what those scary things are? Just like what he was going to do, or how awful I was, or how I was going to go to hell, and it was going to be burning forever, and stuff like that. There was no place in heaven for me, and heaven wasn't even real. So he used these tactics of fear and ridicule they would feed me maggots they would um feed me like i one time i got out and i was in his garage and on cinder black's face down there was a lady and i i'm pretty sure she was dead but there was a recording playing of her pleading for mercy and her back had been stripped of some of the flesh and um they would tell me that's your mother And um, they would feed me things and say, that's your, that's your child. I was too young to have children, but I didn't know it. They would bury me alive and make me claw my way out of the dirt and say I was just being born and I was of the earth. What do you think about that now, so them making that statement of you being of the earth? It's twisted, sick, and stupid, and wrong. Did you understand rituals or any kind of the occult or what, the, what they were involved with? I was raised in it, but I didn't understand it. I was a very rebellious girl. And that made it difficult for them? It made it entertaining for them. They liked the challenge, they liked the screams, they liked the pain. He was a bit of a masochist and a sadist. You'd have to be. Do the things that he did. Their house burned down. So did you attend public school? I did. And they always told me it was just a dream. They'd never leave a mark, usually. Except my dad busted my tailbone when I was learning to drive because I supposedly stole 50 cents for a piece of candy that the attends for his car. He told me, oh, he won't mind. I talked to him. He said, it's okay. You need candy once in a while. It's good for the soul. So I took this piece of can gum and ate it. Went home. You're chewing gum. Where's the other 50 cents? He busted my tailbone. He hit me so hard. Wow. He bruised it. He didn't really bust it. But I couldn't sit for a long time. If you want to stretch out, you can sit there, or you can, well, however you want to do that. I typically sit like this. Okay. 
Yeah, just make yourself comfortable. After these things, tell me some more things that you um, that they made you participate in. You were telling me yesterday about um, blood sacrifices and and they were practicing cannibalism. Like oh, that would be at night. And uh, one time we were in this graveyard. I don't know how I got there, but I'd like wake up in this place and it'd be a weird place like a graveyard and there'd be a long table set up and they'd sit me down and say, you're Jesus and here's your communion and they'd feed me dead body parts that they made me dig up and my sister would be there in a white gown and they would say, she's Mary, you're going to marry her, you're going to have children with her. I never did, of course. And what do you think that meant? I have no idea. It just is weird. It's like some it doesn't make sense. I think that was to make me think I was crazy. Hmm. They were good at doing that. And you were talking about somebody eating somebody's eyeballs. And oh, that was in the Masonic Lodge. Um, they sat around a table. And there was all these adult men. And they had a man who said he was a new member, but I knew he was a cop. And I told him, I said, he's going to get me out of here. He's a policeman. And they found out, and they found his badge. And, um, and this was in the Masonic Lodge? Yeah. It was in a little room in a brick building, and it had a nice floor, and then it had a hidden doorway. And then there was a dirt-floored room with a guy who looked like a fat demon who was red and black and had horns and was cannibalizing and ate him alive basically but they made me eat his eyeballs they said all those in favor say aye and I wouldn't say it and they said and they they made me eat his eyeballs it was really gross because you wouldn't say aye yeah I said aye in the end did you feel fear for your life then? no I did part of the time, but after they fed me his eyeballs, I was like, I don't care what you do to me. You can kill me. I'm not taking this anymore. I'm not cooperating with you ever. I said, you don't keep your word, and I can't trust you, and no matter what I, what you say or do, it's not going to affect me anymore. And I was stubborn from then on. Why didn't they kill you then? It was too entertaining, probably. They were amused. I, I slipped through death so many times, I think it had to be entertainment value. When, how old were you when you left home? 29. And how come so late? Uh, what, were they keeping you there on purpose? Or? I didn't have a car, I didn't have a job, I didn't have friends. We lived out in the country. And I trusted them because I thought, these are all hallucinations. This cannot be real. They're so loving. They're so kind. They're so nice. They're so smart. They would never do this. They look like normal, friendly country people. And yet you saw them participate in these... But who believes that? No one so hears... You, no one told me about it. I just said, you know, no one talks about this kind of thing. It must not be real. Just like they say. So you doubted your own sanity? Yeah. Okay. You weren't sure what was real and at that point and what wasn't and... Uh, I'm trying to imagine what that would be like to actually physically witness these things. To be raped and then not believe it? Yeah. I have a prolapsed uterus. Yeah. There's evidence that something happened. I'm trying to put myself in your position and wonder what that must be How colossally be like. stupid I must be? No, uh, no, not at all. No, I understand the dynamics of abuse, so I don't think you're stupid at all. I'm wondering what that must be like in somebody's mind to see this stuff, experience it. I had no one to tell. When I went to school, the kids thought I was mute. I was so afraid to talk to them in public. I wouldn't, the teacher would call on me and I would, I would just give some off the wall answer. I was sitting in the back of the room and I couldn't even see the teacher. I was so nearsighted. I thought she left. I could hear her voice. I'm like, she's talking and saying things about states and letters and I have no idea what she means. So she'd call on me and ask me a question and say, you're the class clown, but I'm going to call on you again. And I'd say lavender or something like that. And, or I'd say what I just heard 
And she'd say, I know you're listening, but you're not cooperating. And one day she went to hit my hand with the ruler, and I said, I thought all this time you were in another room. She's like, what? And they figured out I was nearsighted shortly after that. Mm. Did you ever get psychiatric help after you left home? Not really. No. I have treatment, but not help. Was it a psychiatrist, psychologist, counselor? It's the one who can prescribe. The psychiatrist? Yeah. Now, how long did you go to a psychiatrist? Since October 19th of 1996, October 20th, actually. And do you still attend that psychiatrist? Do you still no. attend sessions with them? No. Sessions are, do you have any symptoms? Have you seen anything? Um, are you homicidal? Are you suicidal? That's their length of questioning. That's their length of treatment. Okay, take this pill. So, in other words, they, they didn't work out any of the issues that you had or anything like that. They it's all in your basically head. basically kept you medicated. Yeah, they over-medicated me, too, and they gave me a stroke and some heart attacks. I mean, at the initial sessions, you do have to get some kind of background. So you know what you're doing. I told, them, I told them what I'd been told. I imagined it. I made it up. And they said, well, we have to treat this as hallucinations from now on. We'll never believe anything you say because you lied to us. And I said, no, I was confused. I was mistaken and I was afraid. We don't care. We really don't care. And one of them said, um, what you have is a genetic predisposition which has been activated by stress, probably the anxiety of leaving home. Well, that would, would have been a joy more than an anxiety, but in their opinion it would have been stress. And um, it has activated this ability in you to hallucinate and see things that are not there, to have delusions and grandiose ideas. And it will never get better, it will only get worse. But you are alive, take courage in that. And I said, fuck you. I didn't have much respect for doctors, so they prescribed me something for hostility. So before you were 29 and before you left home, you didn't receive any kind of help? Oh, we went to a counselor where I was told the lady joined a commune and couldn't be reached because she was going to go to the authorities. And she disappeared and my parents told me she joined a commune. and. Then we saw another counselor who videotaped us and said, I was told that I was the root of the family's problems. It's all your fault. It's all my fault. I did it. And I said, I don't, they said, do you want to go back? I said, no. You can't drag me back there. I won't say a word. Because I believed what they told me was what the counselor had said. What do you think happened to that lady? I think they killed her. After you left home, you were 29. What were the circumstances surrounding that? My sister had moved out already because she had a car and I had failed driver's training because when I wouldn't wear a v-neck and a short skirt and I laughed at the instructor who demanded I do that, um, he said, you're not going to pass this class. So I drove over a cone in this driving test and laughed about it and he said, you have a bad attitude, I'm failing you. So I didn't get my driving permit and I didn't have a car. And I was kind of stuck there. And my sister called me one day and said, I know you're working at the library and you're borrowing our parents' car and all that. Tell you what, I'm going to pick you up. You can stay with me. She picked me up the next day, and I moved out. And did she experience the same things that you did? No. And why do you think that is? She was a martyr. She wasn't a scapegoat. She was cooperative with them. She could do no wrong. Like, when we were in this one area by a lighthouse near a police station, they had tables set up and they had infants on the tables, real live infants. They told us they were robots and they would dissect them basically. They would vivisect them and fill them with drugs. And they would have kids do it. They were training kids to do it and telling them all they were robots. And my sister was very quick, very good at it and very obedient. And I did one and I said, that was real. I'm not doing that anymore. And they got, they tried to make me do it, and they tried to scare me into doing it. I said, to hell with you. You can do it to me. I'm not going to cooperate. I was a very stubborn girl. And so... Not stubborn enough, but very stubborn. Later on, uh, before you left home, did you realize that, uh, or know that 
your parents were practice, practicing Satanists? Did you understand that? No. Uh, you knew that they were performing rituals, though. I asked him about it. I said, what religion are you? We don't discuss religion. I told you. This is going to get you nowhere. Um, we They had wrote speeches, and we actually labeled them Speech 101 on forgiveness. You never forgive. You are worthless, ungrateful, lazy, blah, blah, blah. So we labeled their speeches, and when we started parroting it, well, when I started parroting them back to them before they were finished, they got pretty angry, and punishment was bodily. But um, I forgot where I was going with that. What was the question? Oh, the circumstances. Oh, oh yes, the circumstances, yeah. I was working at the local library, and by then I might have had my permit. I could drive by then, but I had no car. So I went to live with my sister. I shortly thereafter somehow got a car, and um, I, w I kept in contact with my folks because they were so nice and helpful and would help me buy things like food or clothes from the thrift, thrift store, of course. Never knew. But... Um, I still talk to him. I talked to my mother this morning, and she said, I love you. We had a bedtime ritual where we would climb up on their lap, kiss them on one cheek, kiss them on the other cheek, and say, I love you, Mom, I love you, Dad, and go out. And I would go out there, and I would say, I hate you, I hate you, I hate you. And they heard me one time, so they had to punish me for that and then make me say it again convincingly and apologize to the damn door that I slammed convincingly. Growing up, you experienced a lot of rituals, mm -hmm. blood rituals and all that. Are you are you saying that you never fully? It never hit home. Because you grew up and it was so natural. It wasn't natural. I never enjoyed it. Okay, I don't mean enjoy it natural as in enjoying it. I mean it was so frequent. It was a way of life. It was so normal. I thought everybody yeah. had that happen to them. Okay, that's what I'm asking. That's what I'm trying to get at. And a lot of people did. Had that happen to them. Like people that your family knew and that kind of thing? Yeah. And did you, did you ever talk about it with other kids? Yeah, and they would say, we know you make up stories. We know you're crazy. Don't talk about it. We don't want to hear that kind of thing. You make me uncomfortable. I won't ever talk to you again if you tell me stuff like that. How old were you when those things happened? I was in elementary school. Mm -hmm. Or so, no, after elementary school. It was junior high. So generally people didn't believe you? No. It was no. junior high before I started talking about it. And still no one believed you? No. Mm -hmm. What about high school? No one believed me. So you just I was too normal. So you just lived out your existence. These things happened. Yeah, I'd go home and end up in a hotel room somewhere or a bed and be raped at night by three or more guys and more on the weekends because I said, at least I get Sundays off. I had more after that. And then go to school the next day. So I didn't get a lot of sleep. Did you know how you wound up in a motel room? Probably drugged. Yeah, so you don't remember exactly. Um, I would eat and drink dinner and go to bed and wake up in a motel room. Wake up in a hotel room, and they'd tell me I was married to the guy. And I'd say I don't remember you. And I'd be confused. And he'd say, "Well, you owe me. It's been a long time." And I'd say, "I don't want to sleep with you. I don't know you." And he'd say, "You have no choice." Sometimes they would beat me, and sometimes one of them was actually nice. Just one. He said, "I know you don't like this." I'm going to be nice to you. He tried a different tactic. I actually cooperated with him. Do you think your parents were pimping you out? They were making money somehow. Your dad didn't work? He did work, but they were making extra money probably. Mm -hmm. What kind of, uh, you said you lived, um, your lifestyle was upper middle class? Yeah. Mm -hmm. We had a house with four bedrooms, two and a half baths. It was about 24 to 2,700 square feet, had a two and a half car garage, had 90 acres. We had two cars at least, we had a van, we had a dog, 
We had fish at some point. We had cats at some point. And the house was always clean. Did you have to clean? Yeah, at midnight or so. If I kept my parents up or they heard me snoring or going to the bathroom, I'd get up and have to vacuum and clean and stand in the corner and get hit and berated and told how worthless I was. That was sometime around the time before I started getting the bedroom experiences. Bedroom experiences? The bed with the men. Yeah, okay, but what you have already explained. Yeah.